this talk is I've been working on it for a long time and I mean like five years long time and it started from a book really that I was writing after my first book so the first book was on cloud security and then I started to pivot into big data security and it seems like one of those topics where the more I learn the less I know and I've gotten deeper and deeper to the point now where as I said I was preparing hundreds of slides for this 50 minute talk so I'm trying to pare it down and I'll try to give you a high level but there's a lot of material to cover because the topic is expanding as big data implies. So thanks for coming. I really appreciate everybody being here today. My abstract's a little wordy, I think, but just to get back to what I was talking about, algorithmic warfare is hot. If you do a search on any engine, you'll find just a ton of articles being written. And one of the disappointing things about it for me is every time I read them, they say the same thing. There's very little depth. It's a very shallow topic. And yet there's a ton of things unanswered, which is why I think it's so hard to write about. So I'm attempting in this to basically give you a five-point agenda, which will give you a little bit of a I guess a, a hold to grab onto, to dig into further. I'm trying to get people excited about all these different pieces and give you something to think about in your own daily work. Uh, myself, and I talk about who I am. Uh, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Black Hat, who in 2012, uh, I usually ne never gave an introduction of myself. I just said, you know, whatever I say today is gonna stand on its own two feet. But they said, they, they didn't accept a presentation of mine because they said, you know, we don't really know your, your qualifications or background in this space. And I was so shocked because in 2012 I was, literally running a company that was doing active defense, Hackback. And I was working with a, a lawyer from the US Army, an ex-JAG uh, who was you know, leading cyber and he had done trials on self-defense. And I was like, we wanna talk about our experience and what we're doing in the real world. And they just were like, we don't think you have the pedigree or the, the identity that we would associate with this topic. So just in that sense, here's a little background on me. Um, maybe a little too much background, but in the 1970s, I was basically growing up as a rural American prepper. Uh, I lived out in the middle of nowhere. I had a lot of weird experiences with security where I was shot, I was stabbed, I was bitten by a pack of dogs that were the KKK, chased me around. Um, I was actually skinned, lost a lot of skin on my body and had alcohol poured on me, uh, nearly drowned. I was held underwater by people. So just sort of a normal life in Kansas. This is a picture I took of where I grew up. It's what it looks like. Uh, it's basically the middle of nowhere. Uh, so one of the more interesting things was I was doing a mapping project of the grade school I was in and somebody who I had mentioned it to leaked the uh, mapping project. And so when I came out of the hole that I had crawled under under the school foundation, I was actually grabbed by the principal of the school and held up. And so I had an early experience with OPSEC as well. Uh, and so one of the things I was, you know, growing up with is things like you can actually hear a car five miles away. Can you tell the direction? Are you following the smoke? You know, the, 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 the dust. And so that was just sort of a life for me that I think uh, I was driving by the time I was 12 years old, really sort of set me on a different path than most people, but it changed fundamentally in the 1980s when I was exposed to computers. Uh, my parents, as very poor teachers, were working at a university. So I was immersed in this other culture where I was able to apply a lot of my security knowledge. And I was sort of uh, exposed to things like the Newsweek, the 414s. How many people have heard of the 414s? Oh, please. So the 414s were fundamental, the, the turning point in American history. The reason that we have the CFAA is really because of the 414s and the activities associated with them. Uh, a lot of people misappropriate that for other people. Uh, people know the cuckoo's egg, right? Clifford Stoll, you've heard of that? That was later. That was three years after. Uh, so in 83, we're talking about uh, Cover of Life magazine was the Russians are stealing our secret, they're hacking in. This is before War Games as a movie came out. In the late 1970s, when I was, you know, just a kid, but I was doing a lot of sort of prepper stuff, there was a lot of attempts by the US government to ban hacking. Uh, it's just all been lost in history now, but I remember it because I was involved in this scene and I think now it's getting easier to talk about it. Uh, so anyway, that was sort of the 1980s was the sort of what's really going on. Are you, are you for real or are you just having fun? Well, in the 1990s, I shifted away from technology and I went into the sort of ethics of humanitarian intervention. Uh, I got a degree on Somalia intervention in 1992 or three. Uh, I got my BA and then I got a master's degree on intervention again on Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa. Uh, so basically the invasion of the British into Africa, 1940 to 43. So it seems like a bit of a tangent, but I immediately went back into tech uh, because for me, I was really looking at defensive concepts and computers were like the future of power. It just seemed so obvious to me. And so what happens is data changes our judgment. If you have information, what I learned about, you know, all this study of uh, humanitarian intervention is if you have more knowledge than other people, then you win a conflict. And if you're a very small team, especially, you can have more information than the larger team. That's the asymmetry, asymmetry of uh, conflict. And so you can uh, do much better than you would perhaps do if you were equally sized uh, and not having information, if that makes sense. So there's a hat tip here to Bayes and Fisher, but the idea is that you know through uh, science, through uh, statistical analysis, you can really come up with 
uh, a really good idea of what to do that will be very efficient and uh, very successful with low cost to you. That's sort of the, where we're headed. So uh, after two de decades of InfoSec, I've realized now this is where we are today. Uh, if I talk to people about availability, uh, a little over 24 years or something now, I can basically spell out to them what the loss will be, and it's very easy. It's, for me, it's the entry-level aspect of security. Uh, in other words, cloud and all the stuff I worked on my first book, I can basically eliminate 100% of error in an availability concept, and I can train people on how to protect availability. When I get to confidentiality, it's a little harder. There's a lot of controversy around it, but it's privacy-related, obviously. And so I can, Equifax as an example, I can say, here's what the breach cost, here's what was at stake. It's when we get into integrity that we're having problems. And this takes me back to my early days of humanitarian intervention, where you know the quality of the data really affects the success of a mission. Uh, and I can give you lots of examples now of what that sort of looks like. I think it's the expert level of InfoSec. So taking an international history, history perspective on data integrity, which is ethical judgments, I'll take you through a few series of examples. 1980, you've probably heard of Operation uh, Eagle Claw. So these guys were in the desert with helicopters, Delta Force. Have you guys uh, read the history of how they crashed the helicopters? Uh, there was a guy looking down and he was monitoring a human and the human was walking, but it was a brownout, so he didn't realize the human was moving. And so the helicopters drifted as the human was walking, which led them into a collision. And then everything blew up because you have these vehicles in the middle of nowhere that are uh, laden with fuel. So that was a huge disaster for us. Um, in 2016, we had the same thing with a Tesla. I mean, these connections to me are fairly obvious, where you, have a, you actually had a Navy SEAL who was driving a Tesla, and in this YouTube video, he shows these two vehicles converging. Until the very last minute, the Tesla swerves, and he says, wow, I have collision avoidance. Now, in that case, he was successful, and he survived, and the video took off. It was so viral that Elon Musk himself said, you know, look at our collision avoidance system. Anybody know who that was? Anybody heard of Joshua Brown? Two weeks later, he was dead. That's right, he's the guy who crashed the car two weeks later. I, at the time, was telling him, no, that is not actually collision avoidance. What you're doing is essentially the same thing as Operation Eagle Claw. You're basically drifting and you're thinking that things are going your way. You're not really pinning to an actual avoidance system. You're just doing lane assist or, or nearby. And the reason he died, in the, and I gave a whole talk about this at B-Sides Las Vegas, but the reason he died was because it was a different scenario and he didn't have the capability he thought he did. So overconfidence. Well, let's look at Seychelles in 1981. Not many people know about this, but there was a coup attempt in Seychelles, and the bottom line is these guys dressed up as uh, American tourists, and they tried to fly in, and the people that they rented the planes from and the countries and everybody that supposedly were backing this didn't know who they were because they said they were tourists and they were rugby players and so forth. And uh, the president of Kenya actually said he'd been duped by intelligence, or he was playing politics. But basically, it seemed like he had bad intelligence, and that's how this, this coup uh, went down. Uh, and the, the long and short of it is, basically, these guys went through the the items to declare line and either somebody pulled open a bag and it had a machine gun in it or somebody had fruit in their bag and there was some confusion but it ended up in a firefight and a very interesting case but the bottom line is if I look in 2017 I see people at MIT saying like we can totally disguise ourselves and no one will know who we are and it's the same thing to me because they're saying wow this turtle if we just do a few uh, transforms it'll always be seen as a rifle instead of a turtle but I sit there and I play with it for a few seconds and I broke it completely so it says here turtle you probably can't see it's blurry but they're saying classified as a rifle from every angle that is way overconfident that will get you into a firefight in the Seychelles in 1981 no problem and it'll end your mission in instantly uh, and so it also says no rifles over here so they're claiming it's always seen as a rifle. It isn't. And it's being seen as what it really is, a mercenary. So these are the sorts of things I see from history. Sudan, 1983. Anyone heard of this? Yeah, so we flew in. We killed everybody, uh, 18 of 20 people, and murdered them. And then we were able to rescue the hostages. Uh, what's interesting to me about this is that this was one of the first cases where we were sending in like very abstract information to a fax machine. So these guys basically stood on a roof, and they got new faxes to tell them where the movements of the terrorists were or kidnappers were. Uh, the kidnappers weren't that smart, or maybe they're too nice, because they also let people escape and come back. They literally sent the hostages out, and then they asked them to come back so they could disclose everything that way, too. But if we look at today, uh, Strava is a good example of something like this, where you have this sort of constant movement around, and people can... And in 2014, I'm telling people, hey, Strava is a surveillance tool. I just point this out, because it blew up all of a sudden for some reason. Uh, and so in 2018, I'm talking about it again. I'm like, hey, North Korea is easily used on Strava. And then Unlike my first tweet, which nobody paid any attention to, within a few hours, this is getting you know thousands and thousands of tweets, and people are like, oh my god, you can see running routes in North Korea. So you know, Sudan is a good illustration of how we need to have constant updates, and it's really important to have accurate information to carry out a mission, and now we have that again 
in the modern context. Uh, Panama 1989, people are familiar with this. Uh, interesting case though is that the SEAL Team 4 basically rode up on the beach and then they went sort of towards the airport to take it over. Uh, if you remember what happened, the entire team was eliminated, so they were all killed. And it's sort of a weird thing because people to this day don't know why we used a SEAL team to basically take over an airport on land, uh, aside from the fact that they rolled up on the water. But it didn't really make sense. Rubber rafts over, they're on land, and they basically got themselves into a firefight they couldn't win. I see a similar theme today, and Cambridge was talking about how they were able to basically put you into a car and it would survive any situation through classification, but I simply moved into a different context and their algorithm failed miserably. I got over, they said 90% accurate and I was able to get over 50% failure just by changing context. So it's like the Navy SEALs rolling up on land and whoa, we're in the wrong place. Um, they walked down the middle of the runway and then uh, machine gun fire started and they had no cover and they were lit up by the lights and it was just a disaster. So Fast forward to today, I mean, that's all historic context in international history. When you look at something like what just happened in Niger, the results of the reports are coming in that these people didn't have a picture of their environment. And what's interesting is, you know, when I collide these two worlds of like international history and analysis of risk and how to do uh, integrity of data to have better outcomes, uh, I'm seeing these themes colliding in a sense that since I've been working in tech for over 20 years, people are saying the future is the merge of the two. Basically, it's all these devices and sensors and technology being used in a, in a firefighter, a con a conflict environment because the data is going to make us more successful. The data changes our judgment. And so I would actually expand it, expand it out because AI and ML are really impacting all aspects of our lives today. Uh, what we're seeing is that essentially we're trying to transfer authority to pass judgment. In other words, if I have knowledge, then I can pass judgment, which is an authority that I suddenly gain. Uh, that's typically described in terms of privacy. If I know what happens in your bedroom, if I know what happens in your living room, if I know what happens on the street, those are three contexts in which I can make decisions about you but there's also an integrity piece there. Can you disprove what I've found out? Um, or can I prove that it's true, non-repudiation and so forth? So in that context, uh, every industry I've found so far, and I do a lot of consulting across a lot of different industries, has some degree of this artificial intelligence that they're uh, smoking, if you will. In this case, we see it in other contexts, you know, artificial flavor versus real flavor. Uh, artificial intelligence has sort of the same idea that if you you know, wrap your cigarettes with juicy apple green paper, you get the effect of an actual apple. And I don't think people really think about artificial intelligence this way, but for me, this is kind of the reality of it, that you get some sense of what reality is, and that supposedly is just as good. It really isn't, but I'll explain to you in a minute why it, it can actually cause some problems. Uh, the first sort of context I want to give, though, is that AI becomes a civil rights issue. And so if I break down AI versus ML versus deep learning, they're sort of pieces of one another. So what you're really talking about is the ability to come up with an answer that you trust about issues in life. And that's essentially because it's a machine and it's artificial and it's faster and less expensive. If you take it at face value with confidence, you can repeat a lot of the mistakes we've made in the past. Uh, racism, for example, has been, in some of my other talks, I go through lots of examples of how Amazon has reinforced racist boundaries. Uh, it's very clearly uh, racist. And so Google has had a lot of racist incidents. In fact, I took a bunch of slides out of here that were all about racism. But the bottom line is, that is for me the meta story is that we're impacting all parts of life. Um, it really is about power and it really is about politics. And so, you know, Elon Musk is one of these weird cats who says things that never seem to make sense to me. He doesn't seem to be very self-aware. So for example, he just, he just said, you know, he's giving a graphic warning about AI being a risk and we shouldn't let drones make decisions because they can do great harm. At the same time, he's releasing a flamethrower, which in theory can do crimes against humanity. It's generally considered not a good thing to be like pushing onto a public. And he's selling lots of them. Um, and so he literally says, you know, once something can operate and decide for itself whom to kill, why should it care what governments think? Which is essentially what his behavior is. I mean, by his own standard, I think we could limit his ability to sell flamethrowers. Um, but he doesn't put it that way. But lots of people are seeing this problem all over. Even this math PhD, um, Kathy, she's talked about this quite a bit in Weapons of Math Destruction. I like the awareness. It reminds me of Oppenheimer saying, whoops, I created a nuclear bomb. Uh, kind of regret that now. But she's kind of campaigning in a way that ends blind faith. And for me, that's very dangerous because she's creating a vacuum in response to blind faith by saying we should do something else besides faith-based. You need science to replace that faith. And she confusingly calls Netflix, for example, as safe AI. Uh, I think that's dangerous because Netflix, for example, if I used a better measure than hers, a scientific measure, is not safe. AI, I mean, Netflix can be used for very, very bad things very easily. I can give you lots of examples of how to do terrible things to people with Netflix. Uh, and 
in a sense, her, abdru- her abrupt destruction of faith really invites a sort of instability, and that's not what we need right now. We sort of need tools and methods to address the problem in a way that sh- slowly progresses towards a safer space. Uh, she would, I think, she doesn't have the answers. She has the right idea. So Netflix, just as a quick example, uh, basically asks everyone to visualize data to, to find value. And that has been sort of the crux of the issue in most companies. Airbnb, Uber, all of these companies are pushing people in to gather information and, and look at it without you really authorizing them. I mean, you think you're authorizing them in sort of an abstract way because they ask you, would you like us to look at your data to improve your life? But you don't realize what they're really going to be doing with it. And so you see this sort of power transfer. So uh, just as an example of Netflix, if I wanted to get somebody killed, I would represent what they watched at a certain time and have it be controversial or get them fired because they watched certain things. I could represent them as something they're not. I could say, you know, the sexual preference or racist or whatever. It's all based on what they've been watching and paying attention to. Uh, Years ago, I gave talks about how we can predict who would be a uh, a hacker or a, a violent offender based on what information they were consuming. So Netflix is a very powerful tool if used in the wrong way. Not a good example. Um, but let me back up a step here, back to civil rights, and talk about, you know, what we see, for example, is that there's a manual process of sort of knowledge. And so the courts have talked about, like, there's gerrymandering going on in certain states. In 2016, there's these, these states who seem like they're blue, and they're expected to go towards Clinton. And then mysteriously, there's gerrymandering in those exact states that then flipped, and then you see sort of a Trump win. Well, if you use math, you could just quickly find, figure this out, right? So AI, machine learning, would just immediately illustrate, you don't have to spend all this time in the courts, basically the sort of, here's a match between gerrymandering and what's actually reality. It's a really cool tool you can use. And so it has power to do good and bad, which is why you can't just sort of like immediately say, get rid of these, these tools. So I want to back up to history even further and say, what have we learned from the past about tools that we want to ban? Um, in this case, let's look at tools that have been uh, pretty categorically used for good. I mean, if you look at the piston engine, if you look at, um, I don't call it the combustion engine because I look earlier, the steam engine, and to me, they're the same. It's a big piston being pushed by something, whether steam or combustion or pressure or whatever. So if you have this, everybody agrees that it created a better way of generating power. And if you look at this, fences, you, everyone agrees that it was a much less expensive and more efficient way to sort of protect your assets, you know, with these chain link fences and barbed wire fences. Um, and I don't know if people know, but, you know, the repeating rifle, essentially, this is an early version, of course, ended up with machine guns. So these are three things which are... St- uh, st- but these three things that basically created a, a shift in power, but for good. It was sort of like the new economy was built on these three things. If you watch Western movies, for example, you're going to see some combination of these, the steam train and the, the fences in the Wild West, and then the, the rifles establishing sort of the good and winning, winning the West, right? So uh, more specifically, we saw across the United States, huge expansion of boilers. So these engines were basically creating the West as they expanded across. And again, I give a whole talk about how boilers themselves are a really interesting example of of safety and ethics. Uh, There's a turning point in boilers when they were blowing up and killing a lot of people, and we had to change the engineering of them to make them safe. But there's no question that we use them to make a lot of economic progress. And so barbed wire is kind of the same thing. We actually could reduce significantly the number of people required to manage assets and grow livestock, which is sort of meat as a backbone industry and, you know, uh, health in the United States has come from a lot of this ranching. And and so uh, interestingly enough, this is actually, it comes from telegraph wires. So they galvanized wires to do communications and they realized they could put a twist on it. And then they were like, wow, we can actually create a fence. And so sort of this industrialization speed, they could crank out this fence. And the cost in California, especially, of fencing stuff in just plummeted dramatically. So these are great economic arguments. And so third, the repeating rifle, you have this machine gun. I won't try to dress this up. I mean, really, it was just used to make Earth into hell. But some people argued that it was, you know, made us successful in wars to put away bad people and so forth, or put away the bad Indians and so forth. I think that's, it's just too much of a stretch for me to try to make the positive economic argument. But basically, the economic uh, result of this was the colonials were able to defeat the Sudanese. That was the first real mass use of this. Bodies stacked three, four high as the British unloaded machine gun fire, and that later turned into World War I when they started using it against each other. Anyway, my point is, if you put these three things together, which are all technologies that were used for some economic gain or boom that the the country was going to be benefiting from, and everyone's going to be rushing into these markets, what do you think you end up with? Three forms of automation, technology, moving things faster, economic markets growing, positive outcomes combined after World War I. 
Definitely started with World War I, but it ended up here later. Profit. Industrialized genocide. The three ingredients you need to basically create a concentration camp were the fences to keep people in, the machine guns to sort of exert power, and of course the trains to move them in to get them there as quickly. And so automation has sort of a very dark, tarnished legacy. Uh, another weird aspect of this is that you have it in disguise. So you get there without realizing it. So, you know, in the history of how the, the Nazis invaded Poland, they didn't just go, haha, we're invading Poland. They said, the Polish have invaded us. What are we to do but to invade them in response or to, to drive them back? And they literally took people they killed, dressed them up as soldiers and dumped them around and said, these are the soldiers we killed who invaded our country. So there's a lot of this you know, automation wrapped up in deception. And so integrity becomes a really, really big, big issue. So I know this is a short talk and I'm just trying to cram it together. Uh, this really expands into a five hour talk that I try to give more details. And like I said, I'm working on a book, but let me just jump from there into today again, where we have Teslas that are driving around and you have to ask, are they just disguised private missiles? If I wanted to kill somebody, could I just tell the Tesla, drive over that person? And would I, would I get away with it? Because it sort of seems like they jumped out in front of me. They were a pedestrian and I'm just driving my car. Could I essentially uh, get to the level of killing a person? And then from there, can I jump further to, you know, can I do it for lots of people? This is a real case that just happened in New Jersey where uh, a city got tired of all of the drones, essentially, the Waze led drivers filling their city up. It got to the point where they couldn't pull their cars out of their driveways because Waze algorithm said, go this way. And the city was just 10,000 vehicles all of a sudden packed in the streets. Uh, this happened in LA too, where people are fighting with Waze to try to keep people off their local streets and get them back on the highways. But the question is here, which impacts faster, car swarms or ICBMs? I mean, I talked about genocide, but let's talk about for a minute what missiles really mean. If I want to launch a missile into Los Angeles, a nuclear attack, and there are all these missile defense systems, and there's all this complexity of launching and aiming and so forth, if I had the ability to change the direction of all of the cars in LA so they were 15 feet off to the side onto sidewalks, running over anybody who's walking on the sidewalks, how many people would I kill? How quickly? There's no launch time. They just start doing it immediately, right? And there's really no counter missile because they're there already. They're already in the city moving around. So essentially it's an amazing weaponization uh, problem, which I've started to call ways invaders, uh, which is, I mean, it's an old game and it's funny, but ultimately you're sitting here trying to stop the drones from invading your city. So how are you going to stop those Teslas coming in and running over your, your neighbor or you or your wife or daughter or husband or whatever? So from there, let's go back to genocide. I know I sort of took a leap, but if you think about this big crash that just happened in the ocean, I gave a talk uh, at B-Sides about how uh, naval navigation works. Uh, that convergence of the Tesla I talked about before, right? That just happened with a couple ships in the ocean. Who's to say that wasn't a driverless tanker being run into, being used as a missile? Again, instead of firing a missile, I can create the sort of disguise of a vessel losing control or vessel darkness or blackout. And as they merge together, one spears the other, uh, sailors die. That was just the first couple. But now we have one that actually sank and created this oil slick that's spreading across Korea and Japan. Who wants to spread oil across Korea and Japan and destroy their uh, life, you know, wildlife in here? And it's apparently it's the, like the largest oil slick in history. It's getting to be this huge issue. And it burned for days, days and days. So it becomes essentially a weapon of mass destruction simply be, by colliding two vehicles. And if the vehicles are driverless, as most ships are these days, you can see the power of the algorithmic warfare trying to control things. So, I mean, I can go on and on about the terrible state of things, but let's talk about trust because that's really what I work on is try to how to fix this. Um, and I have actually been in Teslas and we have, ac we have actually made them run off the road. We have proven that they are susceptible to all these risks. So how are we going to build uh, the sort of trustworthy side of these things? Uh, I try to point out there's a two-part system here. It's basically what we want to do is we want to build a standards test and we want to build transparency. And the first is to have an objective to value objective facts. The objective is to think about facts as meaningful. Uh, I like to put this in terms of uh, certifications. So if you pass a test, if I give you a test and you pass it, then uh, objectively you've achieved a certain uh, place. And it, uh, transparency is, can you now show me the work that you used in order to get there? And so these two things should be how we hold things up to a higher standard. Uh, this should reduce the security breaches in integrity terms, and it should increase the accountability we have over people who are allowing integrity breaches while on their watch. So formerly, I had talked about this as step seven. In 2014, I gave a bunch of talks about big data security, which was the book, which then positioned, uh, transitioned, I should say, to big data 
uh, the realities of big data security because I realized how hard it was getting. This was too complicated, I found, in a lot of the consulting work I've done. And so I've modified it now to just four steps, which is much easier. There are three things we're really working on, foundational authorization and authentication, encryption and audit. But above that, now governance, risk and compliance is where we're going to find that transparency and standards. And so if you have that across these uh, big data infrastructures, we're going to be able to start to reduce some of the breaches we're seeing. And that includes vulnerability management and so forth. So this is not a new problem. Uh, again, in history, we've seen this before, probably through the entire history of technology. But just as an example, the printing press, you know, a long time ago was technology that distributed a lot of stuff, for good and for bad. The printing press was essential in abolitionist uh, movements to get rid of slavery. It was a very powerful tool. But today, you still see this problem where people are getting posts that are like contradicting each other. And who do they trust? And how do they know which one's right? And has it been intercepted or changed in transmission to them? Why would they believe either one of these? Uh, so I try to not get too hooked on the motives behind all this technology. I try to think about the consequences. What's the consequence of distributing faulty data? And then who should we hold accountable for doing so, for not telling the truth? Uh, in particular, I try to get away from things like, is it a nation state that's attacking me and all that sort of talk? Because I'm not sure it really matters whether it's a nation state or it's not a nation state. And one of the weird things I've noticed lately is people saying, is it dangerous now because nation states have gotten into computers, but then Almost in the same breath, they'll say, is it dangerous that non-nation states have gotten into drones? Which to me is weird because they're essentially the same thing. Um, you might have heard about Russia recently getting a swarm of drones attacking them and people saying, oh my God, this is a turning point because it means non-nation states are attacking us with drones. But then every hacking incident you see, people are like, this is a turning point because nation states are getting into computers. And it, it doesn't matter, right? Nation states, non-nation states, threat models are important, but for the Bottom line, the consequence of the harm essentially is what we need to be after. Um, the commodity effect of it, the, the inexpensive aspect of it. So let me look at it from terms of philosophy then. If we're really going to talk about consequence and harm, it takes us back to philosophical tenets, which goes back to the 1600s, which is, and, and this is very important for AI and, and ML, is if I think I am means I have responsibility. It's not God who's issuing, this is what Descartes was really talking about. You're saying it's not God who's telling me what's right and wrong. It's I can actually come up with my own answers and right and wrong. Remember Elon Musk saying, well, if they come up with what's right and wrong, how are they not going to kill everybody on the planet? Well, it's because we have these principles that you're not supposed to do harm. And that goes back to the John Locke, who beautifully put it as you need a reflective process and articulated steps. And that is almost identical to what you find in machine learning uh, practices. Is they're always talking about how can I see what's happening? How can I reflect back? Um, unsupervised learning, for example, is going back and reflecting and improving. And then can I articulate it in a way uh, so it's very clear what step I'm taking? Decision points. Um, even more to the point, there's a groundbreaking new research being established. It's called the bottleneck theory, which really to me is like the 1700s David Hume's empiricism theory. But they're saying now in AI that if you follow a bottleneck, machines essentially are paring away unessential information to make a decision based on essential information only. And so if you ask them to be transparent and reveal what they were doing, it used to be people would say, well, I didn't think about that. So it's impossible for me to get out from the system what it's really doing. It's invisible to me. But now they're saying, well, it's following a process of elimination. Uh, very much like if I wanted to open a door handle or a doorknob, I would uh, get rid of all of the doorknobs that don't look like the one I'm about to open, right? The, the rectangular one isn't relevant to me if I'm trying to turn around one. And so this empiricism that comes from David Hume from the 1700s is being sort of applied now in the, the latest theories, uh, which means we're pretty early in our <laughs> ethics exercise. Uh, David Hume was early in the ethics uh, exercise. So I talked about some of these before. In 2016, I talked about this missile crisis. Uh, but I talked about it in different terms. I basically said that the reason why we went through automated driving so far, you know, we went from 1956, 57, 1960, talking about driverless cars, and then it disappeared from the map. Anybody remember why? What happened in 63, 62, 63? Cuban Missile Crisis. So we went through this process of automation, and then people got scared, and then there was no talk about driverless cars after that, and through the 1970s. Nobody wanted to talk about the automation of cars anymore. And I think uh, a lot of this comes back to uh, history tells us, essentially, that if we take this sort of self-interested, rational behavior, we are not going to save ourselves from this doom-like state. That's what sort of Musk is trying to, uh, uh, trying to explain, but I don't think he really understands what the true path is here. And that is, compromise is what works. And realistic compromise is becoming a very alien commodity for most people. You hear people, you know, 
right now in the U.S. regime leader, he's basically talking about how you can't compromise, he won't talk to people, he won't, and that is not a good approach. That will lead to very drastic, very dangerous uh, brinksmanship. Whereas what we really need to think about in terms of ethics and, and cars, especially in machines, is how do I make a compromise here that works out for the best of everyone? That's a social good con construct. And so in this map where we talk about over the years, the actual victories and wars have gone down as negotiated settlements and other terminations have gone up. So we need to think more in terms of these great compromises in our machines if we're going to be thinking about how conflicts are going to work out. But really, and this is where it gets a little complicated, but really what I'm trying to get to, and this is my latest attempt to express what's happening, is the machines that you're putting your information in are acting in their own self-interest. They haven't expressed a social good yet, or they haven't had people leading them towards a social good that is actually meaningful. They will think they're doing this, but it's a very unrealistic attempt. And so what you actually see then is taxation without representation. In a sense, you have a tyrannical system, a, a platform that is based on tyranny because they think they know what's best for you, and you have no way of getting what you think is best into the system or getting it to direct or direct it in a way that would be good. Uh, and so the, the GRC for me is very difficult to establish that my fourth peer, peer, I can build the bottom three because it's a technical solution. And I am building it into solutions that are big data based, right? Spark, Hadoop, that's what the book originally was about. But then I realized if I can't get the GRC established to actually make sure that the bottom three pillars are working, what's the point? Um, I really need people to get on board with establishing a standards based test. Uh, like for example, the users can take their data out of the platform. If you can't take the data out of the platform, it's not your data, you don't really own it, then that's, you fail the tests. You do not go on to graduate school. You stay in high school and remedial training, after school specials. Right and to Right to be forgotten. Yeah, exactly. So these are exactly standards. And the transparency is that the users have the right to represent themselves, uh, which means they want to be safe from harm. I find this harmful, so I want to be safe from this harm. The way democracy typically works, we've established that these types of actions are harmful to us, therefore we limit them, um, especially if you're taking something from me, which is the algorithms that are taking your data. Essentially, they're taxing you. So they're getting value from you. You want representation and what they're doing with it to you. This is old government theory. I mean, I'm basically applying old concepts to new technology. And so we see crazy examples like in 2011 when you have God view of, of Uber or even in uh, 2016 where we see Evernote where people are like, wait a minute, they can see everything and they can do anything they want. I mean, Uber is a good example of where with this God view, you could do mass damage to cities. They did actually. I mean, they, they would, they didn't, for example, they didn't map throughput of people on a street, which is the ultimate city goal. How many people can I push through a street per hour? They mapped how many Ubers was I moving, or how many Ubers were moving around and how much money were they making? And nobody cares how many Ubers are moving. They care how many people are moving. So th these are sort of the conflicts that we started to see. They're acting in their own interests, uh, uh, so we have lots of fun examples just to lighten it up a little bit. I know I talk about Holocaust and some terrible topics, but here's an example, a real world example where we were able to get a uh, motorcycle to turn into a car. And so, you know, this is, it's fun because you have to ask, well, why is it, there's no transparency here at all. So you have to ask, well, why does it think that we're something else? Again, I mentioned with the Tesla, I was able to get it to drive off the road. In theory, I'd be able to assassinate somebody using a Tesla. That's uh, a deep topic and it's very interesting and sort of fun, but it's neither standards based nor transparent. So you can sort of see, I can reverse this and I can explain to you why it failed. Uh, there's a big hint here. What happened here that's different from the rest of this path? No. Uh, basically, a motorcycle has, uh, if you're using a gyroscope, if you're using a sensor that, that has movement, the, the motorcycle's moving around a lot, right? Until we get into a straightaway and then we gas it, and if we go really fast in a straight line, it suddenly looks like a car. Now, you can figure that out because you're a human, you can think through the process of what the sensors are looking for, but when you get to really complicated big data, it's going to be a whole myriad of sensors that are coming up with an answer. And if, they're, if we're not talking about something fun like, are you a motorcycle or are you a car, but we're saying, are you a convicted felon or are you a free person, it gets really serious really fast. And so these are sorts of the problems we're dealing with. Uh, here's a not fun example. So Facebook, which continuously has a lack of standards and a lack of transparency, is trending towards a democracy collapse. And we've already seen people reporting this as predicted in about 2008, 2009. People said if you centralize all the communications of a, of a state, you'll end up with a much worse state because you've created a monopoly-like uh, oppressive control of people's right for expression. That's exactly what's happening now. In Cambodia, we're seeing that this unrepresentative, monolithic platform for speech is crushing democracy. There's no way for people to represent themselves there. And we sort of can see this happening if we go over time because the person who's running security at Facebook with no accountability for integrity failures, you know, was told, for example, uh, 
external warnings that Ukraine is going to be doing these Russian attacks. And in 2016, uh, they said there's no signs of this, even though they'd been warned of it happening, and even though the Russians had actively started the campaigns on their platform, they really did nothing. Until 2018, an external entity was forcing them. The FBI and other people, law enforcement, were coming in and saying, yo, we're actually finding by forcing you to tell us what's going on uh, that there's quite a bit of terrible activity, integrity attacks, if you will. And so the, the speech by the guy who went in, he's basically saying, like, I'd love to build upon the history in the years to come of what Facebook has been working on, and I really had a wonderful time at Yahoo, which then, right after he left, disclosed a massive breach, one of the largest breaches in history. So I think there's a theme here. It's because he wouldn't participate in their NSA program, though. Alex quit Facebook because he refused to build their NSA surveillance, or he quit Yahoo because he wouldn't build their NSA surveillance. Program. Refused to work with the United States government, correct, and then went to Facebook and collaborated with the Russians. I guess you could put it that way. If you want, I wouldn't put it that way. The Russians did it the month he started there. So literally the month he went in, June 2000, yeah. But you think he's a, he's a plant? He doesn't have to be a plant. He's just not responding to the breach. I mean, was the Equifax CSO a plant for people who are right, stealing? The, right. so the question is, are they negligent on their watch? And I think the answer is pretty clear. Sure. Yeah. Were they involved in it or not? That goes another level. But it seems pretty obvious. You would attack him if you wanted to do something bad because he's not going to do anything about it. And so you see, for example, if you look at what's happening is they actually have a money model that's if you contribute to an atmosphere of hatred, you get paid pretty well. And so if you try to take back, you know, this sort of ethical model and you say, is there a reflective process? Are there articulated steps that people should go, go through? The steps here are automatic guns have a potential to save lives. And that's the lobby that you constantly see. Guns can protect us from all sorts of harm. Oh, so we should get guns because guns are good, as I was talking about before. It's the third pillar of the automation. And then we profit somehow. And then you get these incidents like um, Las Vegas and people are like, wait a minute, shouldn't we stop this? And there's this big disconnect, right? And meanwhile, these platforms are pushing all the time that you know, you really want bump stocks. And even though the people who are writing it believe the opposite, you would expose all of this if you had any sort of standard, any sort of transparency. You would find people who are intentionally lying to you for their own purposes, selfish purposes, which in this case tends to be, the dude's just making money to lie to people. He's literally writing things he doesn't believe in. Uh, so if you look at the Tesla example, because I like to sort of position Tesla again as a weapon, you can see that if you decompose decisions into these sub-decisions for the car, again, automatic auto has the potential to save lives. They say that all the time. Driverless cars could save lives. But what if they don't? What if we use them like automatic weapons to kill everybody? And so you have to ask, you know, does the car merge right because it has an algo avoidance system? It saw a moving bridge and decided, you know, this is the right way to do it. We need to understand essentially what was the decision process used to create huge amounts of harm. So that's how the, the two-step process works. And so there are a couple caveats here that I want to make sure we, we cover, which is a CSO that's just saying, I'm doing my best to stop this isn't transparency. And we really need to dig in more than promises because they become empty if we don't know what's really happening. We don't have any way of tracking it. And so Twitter says, you know, these tactics are unacceptable and we're working to stop Devumi, but do we know that they're not going to allow another one to bubble up right behind it? We've seen this repeatedly with Facebook where they've made statements about diversity. They've made statements about uh, commitment to values and it never turns out to be true. Um, so it's become sort of a, a joke almost when they say they're going to fix things. Another opaqueness to, to worry about is, you know, if they say that you have to pay to play and there's no way for you to uh, fix it yourself, then you really don't have any sort of control over it. Uh, this is like the mall versus the town square. So in the town square, you have a democratic process to sort of evaluate speech and uh, inter interact with the people who would make decisions about what you can and can't say. But if you have a mall, you really can't do any of that stuff. So the platforms themselves have to do more than just create an opaque playground. And so it comes down to ultimately, if you have a two-step process, can you hold people culpable? Are they culpable of sort of sitting at it, sitting and watching abuse of the platform and remaining neutral. We definitely saw this with Standard Oil, for example, where in 1940, September 7th, 1940, Standard Oil management was reporting, which we can see today, that despite the Allied blockade, the Nazis are still getting our refined products. That means oil. What was the oil being used for? Bombing London. So the bombers that were dropping bombs on London were getting fueled by Americans who were sending it to Germany, through Nazi Germany, through Romania. So what would be the situation today if you see the Russians are pushing this campaign through a platform and Facebook is saying, we were too slow to recognize this, we really took our time before we dealt with the problem, what culpability exists? And so just today, you know, people are saying Facebook's trending news section for Amtrak are conspiracy theories. So 
Here you see it's bananas. They have not fixed this yet. So they continue to see the problem going on and on. I mean, Facebook is kind of an outlier in what they're working on because they seem to be the least uh, clueful, the least capable in terms of security. But don't, you know, don't get too wrapped up around Facebook. It's just an excellent example of how to do things wrong. There are lots of bad examples. One of them is, you know, drug companies watched as 20 million pain pills were dropped on, you know, under 3,000 Americans. And if you look at the map, again, through visualization, you can see they dropped the pills here, death spread this way across West Virginia, death spread from West Virginia across the United States, and they just kept shipping the pills. It doesn't make any sense to anyone who looks at this other than to say, well, self-interest. So is Facebook self-interested in pushing this toxic com communication? Is the drug company complicit in pushing toxic pills that are known to cause, you know, healthcare risks. That's sort of where we're headed with these uh, algorithmic questions. And so I guess there are two more parts here. The fourth is, you know, how do we seed security rather than waiting to unpoison the fruit? And what I'm going to make the case for here is that uh, I just made up a term here, but advanced misinformation persistence threats, sort of a play on APT, is really more embedded in our culture than we realize. The very nature of advertising is going to be hard for us to parse because advertising is essentially malicious. So let me start with what the, the Russians were saying in 2013. They were saying that the, uh, they're rethinking the forms and methods of carrying out combat, and what they were trying to go for is non-military means. So they're talking about you can get to a strategic goal if you're able to use something that exceeds the power force of weapon in effectiveness, which is like propaganda. This is like an old theory, but they very specifically in 2013 said, we're gonna run this campaign. Um, I gave warnings about this in 2013 when I said uh, you can actually very quickly find uh, a seed set in under four hours on six million nodes. And this was based on uh, research that was done by the U.S. Army. So the Russians weren't the only people talking about this. The, the U.S. Army was also saying um, we can actually take a very small group and we can make a very huge impact on a network very quickly, social network. So the desired output is the smallest possible set of individuals such that, such that if they're activated, the whole population becomes activated. Sound familiar, right? So what we see in, 20, in 2018 is people reporting 1% of social accounts were needed to make the impact desired by the Russians. Uh, very coordinated. Uh, we saw with 10,000, oh, I can get you 10,000 votes in, in Michigan, no problem if you want to change the political outcome of a state by just a few bots, 13,000 bots, 100, hundreds of Facebook accounts, and I can make massive changes. And what they're calling this is gray battles or gray zones. Uh, so what it effectively becomes is uh, people creating the sort of state of affairs where you get people who are arguing with one another and they're basing it on information they're getting, which they think is real, but it isn't. And that is the essence of advertising, which uh, I've presented on before in terms of social engineering. Um, and really what we found is that people who are highly intelligent are susceptible to this because of racism. So a lot of people think, well, you're going to be susceptible to fraud because you're not intelligent. And that actually turns out to be not true. The opposite is true. The more intelligent you are, unfortunately, the more you may be susceptible because you think you're good at making decisions and you have a bias, a cognitive bias. And so the way I put it is a game that has victims rather than players is really not a game at all. It's an example of creating uh, social engineering that transfers value. So if you have self-interest and you put people into a game where they can't win and you extract value from them, it becomes a losing proposition. And that sort of heated, hated uh, environment that they create is one of the symptoms that this is going on on your platform. The harm is from your platform creating this sort of effect. So... Uh, some other people have said that any system or network optimized for advertisements is implicitly optimized for misinformation, very directly. So from that perspective, if you look at the GOP in the 80s, they optimized the United States for misinformation. They literally removed the limits of harmful information that are being pushed to children in 84, and then they vetoed any attempt to put regulations on information being disseminated to people. So again, my GRC and the big data platform, they're basically saying get rid of the, platform, the fourth layer completely and just allow the market to decide uh, what would be uh, child abuse. So ideological child abuse was the risk and the broadcasters said, yeah, we're, we're perfectly willing to go along with it. And the president of the United States said, no attacker should be subject to the tastes of a regulator, right? So uh, just to put this in context, this takes us back to Reagan himself, who actually was a pretty big proponent of tyranny. He was fedding all sorts of tyrants and he was talking about them as people with good sense of goodwill, uh, a good, and uh, he, there were you know, people committing 
crimes against humanity. And he was like, well, they have laudatory goals. So if you put that context around what he was saying as no regulator should interfere with the market, and this is what he's saying is, you know, great outcomes for the market, you get a sense of where we're coming from in the 80s. Ten years later, we had further deregulation that took away even more controls over the dissemination of false information. And so the 96 Telecommunications Act under Clinton, which was pushed by Gingrich, then destroyed essentially, the, it rolled back essentially the controls that were put in place in 1934. And why 1934 is important is because those controls were meant to be anti-Nazi. So at a time when the United States was trying to fight essentially a rise of ti uh, rising tide of hatred and put controls in place, they eventually by 1996 got rid of those controls after 10 years of trying to get rid of uh, misinformation regulations. And so a 2015 assessment of that effect was you have massive polarization. Uh, basically, the harmful monopolies were created, uh, historic consolidation, and attitude polarization. So if you go back to what I was saying before, if you get rid of this governance and you have this like inability, no transparency, you effectively get people making money from polarization and no regulation. And so you get what really was predicted, a sort of terrible, terrible outcome. And so that takes us back to the gray zone where we, we were talking about the Russian objective in 2013 or the way the United States Army was talking about a small group can have a big impact. And it's very much like what the United States was doing in Africa in the 1970s. So when Kissinger wanted to have a conflict with the Soviet Union and he wanted a no-win war that was very inexpensive, he rolled in some technology and he created this destabilization that kept it really hot. You know, 500,000 people died. It was a civil war that lasted for a long time. And so the very definition of gray zone, which people try to say just came up in the last 10 years, takes us back to an old strategy to tie down the attacker with a very efficient way. And so the Twitter you know, group has been attempting to sort of fight this with the Transparency Center, and it actually kind of makes sense. What they're trying to do now is trying to say, uh, we'll actually tell you what's been promoted, we'll tell you who's paying for them, we'll tell you how long things have been running, so it gives you some sense of what's going on. Not a bad move, transparency is part of it. We still need a standard to say what is harmful, but transparency at least is starting to roll from Twitter. Uh, a caveat here is some of their methods have been proven to be easily broken, that's to be expected, uh, but basically when they're saying, for example, we have new techniques for identifying malicious automation, we're looking for instantaneous replies and non-random tweets, the attackers, adversarial attackers just go, oh, well, <laughs> We won't be near instantaneous, we'll be slower, and we'll be more random. Uh, so they can easily bypass that. But there's a whole reason why that adversarial effect happens. Um, and we're seeing that today, actually. We've seen some of that when they got rid of a lot of bots. The bots tried to change their methods of coming back to, to create disinformation. But really the question I want to get to is what happens after transparency? Aside from the adversarial response from the attackers, what if you get transparency? What if Twitter says, okay, here are the ads? And the question now becomes regulation. So if we're going to go backwards in time and get rid of what you know, Reagan and Clinton had done to the market, who has the authorization of data judgment now? Who's going to get assigned this? In the case of Strava, they pushed it to the customer, and the customer was like, I don't know what to do. And they were surprised when they found out what we'd been saying for four years now, that your stuff's exposed. Even though it's all clearly marked here, there was a lot of misunderstanding of what happens on the client end. So maybe the clients aren't the best uh, answer. In the case of Facebook, we found an example where there's public scrutiny applied by a judge who said, yo, Facebook, you have police that are literally saying, if black, shoot them. Now, if that was a drone or an algorithm, and you looked at that, you'd be like, clearly racist. But in this case, it's a U.S. Uh, law enforcement officer who's telling people, recruits in the police department, what to do. So what do you... How do you get the transparency? They actually pulled Facebook messages, and then how did they judge it against a standard? Uh, they basically said, this is a person who's supposed to have integrity. That's not integrity by our standard. All right, so Google has claimed, uh, maybe a little prematurely, that they've actually gotten fairly successful with this. And so they're saying that they can back up their test, their standards test, to before people even get hit by the, uh, the apps on their Play Store. And so we kind of need to go the same direction. If we had a standard of harm, uh, for example, racism, that we can put in place before the messages get pushed to the users, then we can stop. And they say they stop 99% of them before they get there. And they say that the improvements that detected, of course, are machine learning based. So you have to sort of compare this. I should have put some of the Google slides in for examples, but you have to compare this overconfidence with their ability to stop harm with their machine learning uh, search algorithms, which have uh, equated professional with white women only. Or in the latest case, I think a guy used the museum app that shows you what, uh, I don't know if this is true. I didn't look it up. I usually do. That's probably why I didn't put it in. But he apparently put his face in to see which you know, museum face he looked like, and it showed him the penis of Michelangelo. And he was like, what is up with this app? It makes me look like, you know, the, anyway, the private parts of, a, mod of a, a statue. So here you have them saying that they actually can catch things using the machine learning algorithms if you believe 
Again, as Kathy says, don't have blind faith. If there's transparency here, I would love to see it. I haven't seen it yet. If there was a standard here they could show us, that would be great too. But basically, Google is put it, putting us in the situation where we can see that there's a path forward. So we're seeing movements on these two principles, and that's really how we're seeding trust into platforms. Twitter's doing a little bit. Google's doing a little bit. Uh, there's a lot coming from different platforms. So Facebook, in the meantime, gets breached again and again. So uh, on the right, this is the latest, which is really interesting. Their reaction from their users is, you are not authorized to judge for us. Now imagine being on Google's Play, Play platform and having them tell you, we stopped a malicious app from dropping on your phone, and now being on Facebook and them saying, we stopped a malicious ad. They don't even stop it. They say, we, we want to notify you you have a malicious ad or a malicious uh, a account. And so these people are literally saying, Facebook should remain unbiased, neutral. Uh, it's terrible advice, but that's the Facebook user saying, be, be neutral. And in this one, it says, why don't you show the pages? Where are they? You know, if you do remove it, how do we know they're removing real pages? I want to be the judge of this. So compare Strava, for example, where people are just confused and unable to figure out what's exposed and not exposed. Privacy, it's easier, versus integrity, where people are trying to retain control and decide for themselves what has integrity or not. And so what you find, I think, is that Facebook will continue to struggle because I don't think fundamentally they understand security at the right level. And so while Google and Twitter start to pace ahead, uh, mostly because they're more transparent, mostly because they're more committed to these principles, you'll find Facebook continues to fall behind. And so literally 48 hours ago, the CEO is promising a more high quality trusted news and bang, the latest event happens and he's got garbage spewing out of his pipes again. So I think we'll continue that way as long as Facebook continues with the current management, as far as I can tell. And not unlike the Yahoo breach, it continued uh, and got worse and worse. So I guess the, to wrap it all up, what I'd say is remember... Uh, to sort of play on the guns don't kill people, people kill people. A cyber doesn't really kill people, in my opinion. These tools can be used for good or bad, obviously fencing, piston engines. There's a lot of good outcomes that can come from a lot of technology, but Harvard-trained people apparently kill people because that seems to be a recurring theme. Um, this is actually a quote very recently from a guy who was a Harvard graduate, worked at the Pentagon, talking about drones and the future of technology, saying, how cool would it be if you could shoot somebody and they would never know it was you? Isn't that an awesome value statement for us to wrap our country around? Uh, and when I look at the Harvard statements and the folks who are working on this from Harvard, I, I'm not surprised often, based on the distribution of wealth, how they seem disassociated with the social good, social impact of their statements, let alone the technologies they would promote in the marketplace. So I, I do think this really... It's a huge topic, and I do think it comes down to a, a blend of history and philosophy and social science. Uh, Brad Smith, who I've gained a lot of respect for at Microsoft over the years, uh, he's doing amazing work where he literally says, if you don't have a social science background, you're probably not prepared yet to get into AI and ML. It's like necessary to do the work. In the same way that computer science wasn't really... Uh, I mean, so a computer scientists really needed some engineering background in the old days. You could get in, I mean, I don't have a background in computers, but I've worked in it for a long time. You can get into AI and ML and do a lot of good stuff, but I think to have a social science background gives you that extra advantage because you understand really what the outcomes will be. Um, as a EE might understand what the outcomes will be on technology that's based on electricity. If they overjuice it and blow it up and kill everybody in a factory, you know, social scientists will understand if you overjuice the ML and you kill everybody in a, in a town because you just sent your algorithm, the Waze algorithm, if you will, into that city with no real safety controls. So that's where we're at. And uh, thank you for coming to here. <laughs> Any questions? I do work for MongoDB. I uh, do product security. Yeah, big data security. Yeah. I guess you could say I try to help people protect their data against integrity and confidentiality attacks. Availability solved. Uh, great talk. Um, interesting stuff to ponder. I'm wondering, do you have a call for action for people in the audience uh, related to your talk? Like, is there something we could do? Yeah, the code for action, it's a tough question because, you know, these are sort of high level, but really it's those two points. One is create standards, of which standards of harm uh, and standards, you know, so right to erasure is an example, right to have my data, extract my data, take my data. So once you create these things which you believe are rights around data, then you can measure people against those if they're violating them. And the second is to work on transparency all the time. When people say, uh, this is how we arrived at this answer, work towards the articulated steps. Ask them to show how they got there and what their work is. Um, and a lot of times in ML, people struggle. It's one of the weirdest things for me is 
Uh, I'll give you an example of a group I was working with that created a better risk score for loans. And the U.S. government asked them, can you prove it's not racist? And they said, no, it's hidden layers. It goes in, it makes a bunch of computations, and then there's you know, an answer. And if it's racist, it's because the data is racist. We don't know if it is or it isn't. And they said, we can't, can't use it then. And they just walked away. They said, well, we'll shut the project down. I think the code of action, I mean, the, the call to action now is you should build transparency. And, you know, the guy who came up with the bottleneck theory is working on that, for example. The, the transparency that you would build would be, um, for example, example, what were the decision steps? There were, even philosophers do this. I made an assumption here. There are five steps. I made these turns. I made these classifications. So any transparency at all is better towards the goal of making these more ethical, safer. When you talked about self-driving cars uh, and them being used as weapons, it reminded me of the previous speaker who talked about employers backdooring their employees' devices with, with intermediate certificates so that they could enforce policy that the user couldn't see. And of course, we have a lot of that in cars, right? We have cops who want to be able to pull over self-driving cars. There's going to be a real call for security, apropos what you've just been talking about, to have self-driving cars on our policy set remotely by third parties to override what the person at the console does. How do you square the circle between the lawful interception needs of being able to override the driver and the risks of having devices designed to disobey their users? Yeah, it's a really complicated question because you end up with a balance, ideally, you know, philosophically, you end up with a balance where there's not too much power on the client side, the person who owns the device, and there's not too much power on the uh, provider, the service provider. There's some way of figuring out the compromise between them that works out best for social good. Now, uh, in a simple example, the law enforcement folks really, it doesn't always work this way, I know, there's a lot of corruption, whatever, but law enforcement is a representation of a community. And so when you say, like, can law enforcement stop a vehicle, for example, what that means is, can the people who live in, say, a town in New Jersey stop a vehicle which is being directed there by a company or an individual in the car? So can people have a way, it, we call it a back door, but can we have an emergency brake, if you will, built into cars that we can trigger when they're runaways that's a key is given to representation of a community. The social good definition would say if a thousand people decide that this vehicle needs to have its emergency brake pulled and then somebody is authorized to make that call, that's the callback. A really weird representation of this is Dr. Strangelove when the B-52s harden and they start flying and uh, King Kong, Major King Kong, whatever his name is, says, all right, we're going in, boys, we're going to drop the bomb. And everyone's like, call back, call back, call back. So these are old philosophical problems that have been dealt with uh, for a long, long time. But that's essentially what has to happen. Can I ask a follow-up? Is there anyone? Sure. I, I, I wasn't asking about the philosophical as much as the intersection of philosophical and technical problem. Like, do we know how to make a crypto that secures a car, except exactly at the moment where it needs to catastrophically fail because someone legitimate has decided that the car should stop obeying its yeah. driver? Yeah, we, I mean, you, so if you think of cars as missiles, do we have the ability to stop a missile that's in flight? Do we have the ability to stop a plane that's in no, flight? we have like, the ability to stop someone else's missile in flight. Yeah, so, but... Can we, can we direct some other government's missile to stop? Yeah, so yeah, we do have ways of designing that. The question is whether people would allow us to design it. So, for example, dual control, split knowledge, uh, you have to have two keys and people with different pieces of knowledge that come together to create the key and then that's used. It can't happen unless everyone comes together. So it spans jurisdictions. Uh, there's a lot of safety measures. Uh, the technology is possible. It's just whether want, people want to pay for that level of safety rather than just saying we assume people will do the best or the right thing. Yeah, we can design it, yeah. But it's complicated because sometimes the car should be in the control of the person and sometimes the car shouldn't be in control of the person and you aren't sure who should have the key to disable it when and for what reasons. And that's where the self-interest comes in. Well, I mean, what do you do if the government is Bashar al-Assad, who's decided that the cars need to have a law enforcement purpose of killing everyone protesting his regime? That's right. That's a huge problem. But then what if he is actually uh, pushing individuals to work on his behalf rather than being in power? He's actually then creating a coup through a lot of people who are acting on his behalf in a coordinated fashion. And he can't stop them and he's the legitimate government. There's no perfect answer. He could be either one. He could be all the clients coordinated or he could be a coordinated single unit that's controlling everything at once. But ultimately, we can design it in a way that we can reduce risk tech with the technology. Um, and I work on it all the time in the sense that, let me put it this way, after Uber was introduced to London, hit and runs went up 40%. So it's not proven yet that that's the true correlation, but that's the data that we we're looking at and saying, well, that's weird. But then you think about the self-interest economic incentives in San Francisco too, Ubers were killing a bunch of pedestrians and there's all this fight over, you know, is it, 
because people are incentivized to drive around really erratically. And if you made that driverless, why would a driverless car stop? I mean, the human who hits someone might have some guilt or some sense of like, I'm going to go to jail. But if the driverless car kills somebody, why would it stop? Why wouldn't it just keep driving, trying to make more money? And so then the question becomes, who's going to stop that car? Law enforcement, people standing around it, the owners of the vehicle. Yeah, it gets complicated fast and it's interesting. But the technology is possible. We just, people have to pay for it. I deal with this a lot with databases because people want privacy. And so on the client side, they want absolute key secrecy. So everything they put in the database is private, completely private in an extreme sense. But then on the server side, they, they say, we'd like a service provided for us. We say, well, we have to see the data. We have to be able to index it and sort it and do things for it. And they say, okay, well then I'll you know, give you the key and I'll open it up. And then we say, okay, well, you know, we, we're giving you all this data, but we're going to use it for other purposes and we can see all the data. And they say, ah, it's, you know, it's, I hate it. I, I want to go back to private. So you get back and forth. How do you design a system that allows them absolute privacy, but also allows them services? And on the flip side, we build a big repository of data in the server and we go, we don't want any of the clients to see anything they're not supposed to. Uh, we only want them to see a very small sliver of data. So we encrypt everything ourselves and then we very carefully, assiduously give out access. But then at some point, people are like, I need to see more data to really make sense of anything. And so we sort of transfer control over to them until at some point they're like, I can see other people's stuff. This is way too much. This is scary. And then we're like, okay, we have to haul it back. So both sides, threat models are essentially inherently contradictory. It's the conflict between privacy and knowledge. And we move, you know, the Uncanny Valley, we move towards this sort of perfection of like this amazing technology. And then we just drop off and go, that is so scary. I want it to end. And some people think Uncanny Valley then ends up with a perfect representation. I don't think we ever get there. I think we get up to the point where we scare ourselves and then we, re we start over. And that's the cycle of, that's where we went to driverless in the 1960s and never got scared and we just killed it. And now we're starting back towards the driverless and we'll get somewhere, hopefully not to where everybody gets terrified. I think the thing ultimately that will stop Facebook from being bad is that they get scared that people are going to get off the platform. Until that happens, they're going to keep doing terrible things to people. So we're out, we're out of time. There's one more question. Oh, another question? Sorry, I just got right into what you were saying. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so the, the, this question, like the exchange you just had right now um, kind of played into what I was going to say, it's it's very hard on both sides to be like, oh, well, how how are you going to control these, uh, you know, algorithms, you know, doing things automated? Um, I personally would probably tend to go towards complete security, but um, how much of this is determined by, you know, like human behavior? Because it's like. If you look back in the early 1900s when a lot of people were getting rich very quickly and essentially in charge of what technology was going to go out and what was not going to come out, right? Are we kind of facing the same issue today where you got these, uh, you know, very um, smart individuals and companies that have a lot of value and that can create a lot of good products that are useful to people deciding for us what level of security we're getting, how the technology is going forward, and the rest of us are just like, well, if we find a use in it and my life is not, um, you know, completely altered uh, and I'm just still living and making money and, and being able to partake in activities and, and uh, um, entertainment, right, then all right, I don't care. I'll just take the benefit of it and forget the rest. Kind of like in software we have today, like, there's a lot of very poorly written software because testing your software is not demanded by the end user because they don't really even care if it affects them that negatively. Even like with this Equifax thing, right? Like you wouldn't get a car that's not tested correctly because you could literally die. But with software, it's the same. And that permeates again into these algorithms. Like, okay, here's this driverless technology, this automated technology. There are these ethical questions about it, but as long as I get some benefit from it, my life isn't altered, then yeah, I'll I let the other people make a decision for me. So I guess the question for me comes back to where I used to talk about Uber a lot. I don't really talk about it anymore because I think it's clear how unethical they were as a company. But for a long time, for five years or so ago when I started talking about it, I would say there's social harm here, not good. And people would say, I get a cheaper ride. And that was it. They would say, for example, you know, women are safer, but they're not a woman. They would just tell me, you know, I'm, I'm sure women are safer. I'd be, I've done the research. The data shows they're not safer. They're actually hiring a lot of people who aren't getting the background checks done. And there's all kinds of cases of incidents happening. So don't just blandly say that women are safer. But 
ultimately after I'd go through all the cycles of all the reasons they thought were true and they weren't true, they'd come back to, hey, I paid six bucks for a ride across town. I'm not going to stop doing that. And then I had to get into the whole economics of the platform, which is if it's artificially funded from a predatory source to destroy and create a monopoly, there's lots of examples in history of how that's happened. Uh, LA is a great example of how the public transportation was destroyed by people who are intentionally creating a more convenient way of transit. So yeah, that is fun. Yeah. Yeah. So fundamentally it's a, you know, it's a, it's an old social problem that people have to see social good. Now, let me just end on this because I'm supposed to wrap up. There was a study done by Microsoft and they've done a lot of interesting stuff in this area that uh, went to the IOT actually and, and they testified in front of the US government about uh, privacy concepts around the world. And what they said was when they studied uh, Sweden and the United States, if you gave somebody a chocolate bar, for example, they'd give you their privacy. There's sort of an immediate gratification on the individual level. But when they studied India and China, they found that people were like, no, I'm not giving up my privacy until they said I can cure cancer. If there was a social good attached to it, everybody was willing to give up their privacy. So not only is there a social aspect here where people are raised and you know learn from what's good and bad uh, based on selfish versus uh, selfless reasons, but there's a cultural aspect here and it's almost by nation or by ethnicity that people are trained in certain ways to respond differently to technology. And that's fundamentally why diversity is so important in, in a lot of these technologies is because you get people in who understand that there's a selfless angle to this, not just a selfish one. Uh, a lot of these companies that end up very selfish have everyone thinking the same about how good selfishness is. And then there's surprised to learn that there's another way, which is just like a drone that's operating in a selfish way and it hasn't been trained on a data set that says selfless behavior is g beneficial, right? So uh, you can break a lot of these companies by getting them uh, more diversity and they start to see there's another way of thinking and there's actually a longer tail or there's a better outcome for them than what they're basing it on, the selfishness. Uber is exceptionally selfish and I saw it right away because I have a, you know, sensitive to people that are trying to get some without giving any, so. Thank you.